And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm so excited to welcome tonight Robert Bailey, the Wall Street Journal best-selling author, here to give us the inside scoop on his brand new red hot book, Rich Blood, out Thursday. Robert, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Ravens. Tell us about this book. Hey, thank you, Sarah. It's an honor to be here. Very excited that this week's finally gotten here. Uh, Rich Blood is my eighth novel, and it is uh, the first book that will feature uh, Jason Rich, who is um, definitely the most flawed character that I've ever written about. He has uh, been a fun character to work with because he's kind of a scoundrel. You know, he starts off the story uh, as a uh, he's getting out of rehab. He's been suspended by the Alabama State Bar. He has billboards everywhere, which is a big thing. You know, in the southeast, there's a lot of uh, lawyers that have billboards. And then as he's coming out of rehab, he gets called back home to Lake Connersville because his sister's gotten in all sorts of trouble. She's been arrested for the murder for hire of her husband, a, a beloved doctor in the small southern town. So uh, Jason uh, comes home where he grew up to uh, basically try to, to save his sister's life and maybe even his own as he uh, as he goes back home. Ooh, and just like that, you hooked us good. <laughs> I can't wait to get the scoop on all things Jason and Jana Rich uh, and this fabulous, fabulous series. Thanks for all the hearts and thumbs up on Facebook, y'all. I see ya. If you've been here before, you know how this goes. And if you're new, here's how it goes every Monday for hashtag Mystery Monday, because you know Mondays can be murder. I give you my handpicked featured authors, and you get to ask them anything. So ask Wall Street Journal bestselling author Robert Bailey about this ambulance chain bad boy Jason Rich he's written ask him about his real life career as a lawyer uh we're gonna need to know more about this overlap here <laughs> is truth is is life on the page following real life uh we need to know all the things and you've got another book coming out in October golfers Carol and you're a lawyer you got a lot going on um let's get into the comments Melissa Watson saying hi Sarah and Robert joining us live from Australia hey Melissa good to see you here thanks for tuning in. So let's start with, um, this is your first book in a new series. You're currently working on book two in the Jason Rich series. Um, where did you get the idea for this crazy character and the, and, and the story? So I think like a lot of writers, I keep a little notebook when I come up with a situation, very much a situational writer, I will, uh, I'll jot it down so that I don't forget it. And a few years ago, I was just, you know, as when you're traveling a lot and I do as a lawyer, you pass a lot of billboards. A lot of lawyers have them and um, they're they're eye catchy and uh, and they must work because they're everywhere. And so um, I thought it would be cool to feature a, a novel about one of these billboard lawyers. And then I thought it would be especially cool if um, perhaps the lawyer, while very successful, may have not had an actual trial. And so. In this story, Jason Rich has never tried a case before. And so I wanted to put him trying his first ever case in a situation that had a lot of family drama. And so he's representing his sister. It's a criminal case out of his wheelhouse. And so that was the situation that came up. And I just sort of, you know, it's like uh, a recipe. You start, you know, adding spice to it as you go and uh, trying to come up with it, make it even harder and harder for him. And uh and that was uh, that's kind of how it started. Well, I, I like the the seasoning and the spice analogy. I'm a cook. I love love to cook. So this is an analogy that's working well for me. Anissa Joy joining us live from South Carolina. Good to see you, ma'am. Saying hello, Sarah and Robert. Anissa, always a pleasure to see your name pop up. Anissa's a bookstagrammer. She does a lot with friends and fiction. Uh, Jenna Bush and uh, Mary Kay Andrews. So many amazing people. Anissa, always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Melissa saying she loves a flawed character. Um, and she said that she, it's so interesting that so many lawyers turn out to be authors. So let's start with that. Uh, and, and she was the one who asked about the idea for the book. Thank you, Melissa. I'm sorry, I forgot to highlight you for that. Um, so let's talk about these, this lawyer turning to author thing. Um, Robert, did you always want to be an author? Did you always want to be a lawyer? Did you always want to be both? Did this come about by accident? What's the scoop? Okay, so um, I went to high school in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, and, uh, you know, 
we read To Kill a Mockingbird, I guess, when I was a sophomore in high school. Still remember reading it very well. Um, even remember where I was sitting in my house when I read it because it was you know, a special book to me. And uh, around the same time, Grish, John Grisham comes out with his first five novels. And so I think the combination of just loving that type of story made me probably want to be a lawyer and a writer. Um, I love that. I love that. So your interest in writing and and seeing justice on the page in both the Grisham and Kill and Mocking where it influenced you at, at such a, a young age. And now you're chasing justice and, and writing pages. Very, That's very cool. Uh, so you said you could still remember where you sat to read that book. Where were you sitting? It was on a really kind of uncomfortable couch in our <laughs> living room. I don't know why I sat there, but uh, I think I was probably trying to get away from my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your brother's watching right now. <laughs> and Nisa would like to know, uh, who was the hardest character to write and why? Great question, Anissa. Um, I think just generally for me, the hardest characters to write sometimes are the villains because uh, the villains in the story, a lot of times you, know, you want your villain to be believable and to be, um, you want the, reader to understand the motivations. And so um, I think, uh, you know, in uh, in a mystery thriller where it's whodunit, a lot of times the villain is not known until the end. So you have to kind of plant the seeds with several of the characters. And so, but I think character motivations are key. Um, and uh, I think, you know, for me, uh, I can't think of a single like hardest character in all of my books that I've written. I just think that uh, generally when I'm going back and editing, uh, particularly with the villains, I try to, you know, make sure that I understand, you know, what, why they're doing what they're doing. That is interesting. So um, when I hosted Isabella Maldonado, who is a real life police captain turned author, um, someone asked her a question and she said that in her days as a police captain, she noticed that the real life bad guys never see themselves as bad guys. They always see themselves as the victim. They always see themselves as someone who someone else has wronged someone else has has they you know hurt them and so they see their motives as pure so when you're writing your villains and you're trying to understand them do you have do you have sympathy for them do you do you do do you does that help you get in there thinking of them being wronged in some way i think yeah, I think that help, you know, whatever it is, whatever the whatever the reason is, you really want to try to get in their head and and try to think the way they do. And, and I sometimes will put their thoughts on the page. And so, um, you know, I shift point of view in my books. And so you get to get inside the villain's head sometimes. And so um, the uh, the villain in Rich Blood is a young uh, meth lord in Sam Mountain, Alabama, you know, it's a, a region in near Gunnersville that's kind of, um, you know, known, I guess, or one of the things it's known for is having, you know, some pretty rough characters. And uh, and this this villain, Tyson Cade, is sort of a young guy that's kind of risen to the top by just being very good at what he does. And um, his uh, his motivations in the story to stay on top. Um, and to never keep moving, you know, because if you don't, you know, you'll, you'll get dead as he says in the story. I think, um, that was probably one of the more difficult things, but sometimes it's fun to get in the bad guy's minds because, you know, um, it's kind of neat to, you know, just sort of it's writing and reading or an escape. And so when you get into, uh, making it up as you go, sometimes it's kind of fun to explore, um, you know, the bad guys and why they're doing what they're doing. So, <laughs> wow. Okay. We're seeing a whole new side of Robert Mailer, a <laughs> uh, lawyer by day, a thriller writer by night, part-time bad guy. On the 
Um, so this book is racking up all sorts of amazing praise, Robert, including from the incredible Patricia Cornwell. Congratulations on that. Let's take a look at what she had to say um, right here, saying Rich Blood is a deliciously clever legal thriller that keeps you turning pages fast and furious. Robert Bailey's latest is wildly entertaining. First of all, congratulations. I love Patricia Cornwell. I know so many people here do. Um, Robert, you're eight books in. What have you learned about how to make a book that makes Patricia Cornwell and the rest of us turn those pages fast and furious? How do you make it happen? Well, I think that, uh, you know, you as a writer, you have to keep reading, you know, people like Patricia Cornwell that know what they're doing. And uh, I think one of the joys of reading is like music. You hear the beat in your head. And um, I think a really good um, writers are able to keep um, the pages turning and they they just hear the story. And so maybe they've really exhausted the reader with a lot of details in a chapter. So they come back with a shorter one, which is kind of a reward for getting through the long one. And um, I try to do that in my stories. Um, I feel like I've gotten better over the years. Um, it took me eight years to write The Professor, which is my first novel. Um, I've got probably two drafts somewhere here in the drawer that never you know, made it out because they weren't good enough. Um, They're way too long. And so somewhere in the writing of The Professor, you know, I put the 10,000 hours in and um, learned kind of how to how to make it flow. And while I was doing that, I was reading a lot of stories and I've always always loved to read. And so I think at the end of the day, I try to get out of my my head and just tell the story, you know, page at a time and uh, try to think of it as storytelling more than, uh, you know, writing, because uh, that's when it's fun, when the story's flowing, just like when you're reading, when the story's flowing and it's popping and you don't want to stop. I love that. So what do you do on the days when it's not flowing, when you do want to stop? I'm asking for a friend and the friend is me. Yeah. So this is going to sound like some kind of dance, but I call it um, flow and grind. Like, Ooh. <laughs> writing, writing is a flow activity and to be to be good at it or to to pile up a lot of pages, you've got to get into the zone or the flow. But the only way you do that is by grinding it out every day and making yourself sit in the chair. And um, and so, you know, I think you have to have the grind before you ever get the flow. And so there are days when I sit and grind it out for two hours and I've written nothing but a bad paragraph and I'm probably going to have to scrap. But the next day, you know, or maybe it's two or three bad days in a row. And then you have the day where you've written 15 pages in an hour and you've got tears in your eyes because you've written something emotional. And it's, you know, that's the grind days. Uh, you know, the, the flow days make the grind days worth it. And so uh, I think, um, you know, I actually write that on my, you know, I keep little notebooks like this and I'll write that, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to when I forget, you know, I mean, I think all writers suffer from imposter syndrome. And so um, I forget sometimes, you know, what has gotten me to where I am. And so um, you really have to just make yourself sit there and occasionally just writing a simple piece of dialogue or scene will get it going again. So that's how I do it. Flow and grind. <laughs> I'm here for the flow and grind. I love that. <laughs> Melissa says, I can't pick which part of the USA you're from. Um, so, Bob, you're from Alabama, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. So, Melissa's joining us live from Australia. So, oh, it's wow. it's so interesting when you hear uh, accents from other countries, right? Like, I can't tell, you know, a, a Western Australian accent from from uh, from a Cairns accent, from a Tasmanian accent. So, yeah. So, Melissa, so there's the same over here. So, we have we have lots of different accents. So, Bob is from Alabama, which is southern. Uh, in the southern U.S., and so uh, that's the lovely melodious um, accent that we're, that we're hearing tonight. Um, she'd like to know, Robert, how do you choose the names of your characters? Yeah, so I love that question. So we've got Jason Rich, which is a funny name. He's an ambulance chaser uh, lawyer, and tell us, tell us how you came up with that. Well, it was critical, I thought, with his name to have something that would look good on a billboard and that would look good with a jingle. And I thought the get rich thing was pretty close to the line of what would be allowed. I actually talked to a friend of mine down at the state bar. I was like, I know you're, 
you can't tell me whether you would, you know, accept this or not, but it, would it be close? And he's like, yeah, we would definitely, it would be close. And so I thought it was good enough. And so I wanted the, uh, the name to go with a jingle, like in an accident, get rich. And so that's where Jason's name came from. Um, and then, uh, and then other names, sometimes I'll, I give Easter eggs to myself, you know, I'll pick um, somebody's name that I like, or I'll merge two names like Rick Drake, you know, two from my first series was two of my best friends, first name and one of their last names. And so, um, you know, I ordinate a lot of times I will see somebody random like a bank teller who's got an interesting name and I'll be and I'll write it down because I think that's cool. I haven't seen that before. So um, I naming the characters is a fun. I, I enjoy doing that. And how did you come up with? Jason's sister Jana, and how did you come up with your villain names in uh, in in the book? So Jana is um, a name that I've always liked. I've always loved that name. Um, it's uh, I've had uh, I have a family member named Jana. I've had friends named Jana. Um, I wanted the the, the uh, Jana Rich has got. Um, she is. Uh, she is a pretty complicated character and she's really strong. I wanted her name to be something that would be just a kind of a strong sort of, um, you know, fierce name. And it just sort of, and I kind of like the play off Jan and Jason, brother and sister, you know, so it sort of just rolled together um, that way. Thank you for the fabulous question, Melissa. And Robert, thank you for the answer. I love that you give yourself Easter eggs, so fun little treats or little fun nuggets that you hide throughout the book. Um, right. That is so, so fun. We have a mystery user saying, this one is on my TBR and this cover is gorgeous. So tell us the story of the cover. Did you get to pick it? Did you get to be involved? Did you love it at first? Tell us everything. Okay, so I do love the cover very much. Um, I uh, what I do is I'll give ideas to the publisher of what I think the cover should be, and then they'll they'll throw things back to me. And so here, I really thought it was important that the water be in it, and I thought it was neat the way they used the rich name as well as blood, which signifies so much in the story uh, in terms of family as well as just the sinister nature of some of the elements in the story. And so. I really liked um, that. And then they sent this to me. And what's cool about it is when I when we shared it, the person that took the photograph they used actually reached out to me and said, "This that's my photograph. And so that's actually a, a picture of a real boathouse on Lake Gunnersville. So it's very authentic to place, which is one of the things I like best about it. That is so cool. What a great story. And what a thrill for the photographer to see this used on the cover and then to take the time to reach out to you. I love right. this. Oh, really I love neat. this. Liza saying, yay for the flow and grind. <laughs> Hi, Liza. <laughs> Leech is saying, your book sounds like a great read. I love page, tur page turners. And she would like to know, Robert, which was the hardest character for you to write and why? Um, I think in this book, probably, um, probably, I think the hardest character to write was um, probably Jana. You know, Jana has good qualities. She has bad qualities. She drives her family crazy, her daughters and her, her brother. Um, but she is the straw that stirs the drink in this story. I mean, everything that happens, I mean, she's a gaslighter. So she makes everybody, you know, really um, question their own sanity, but, but they all love her. If that's the, the, uh, the quintessential family um, catch 22 is that they all love her and they, um, and they are all attracted to being around her. And so um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to capture that right. Cause I think, um, especially in families, you have that dynamic where maybe there's somebody that you just, you know, sometimes just drives you nuts, but, but you love them. And, um, and then you find yourself doing stuff for them. And I think that's what, uh, is happens with Jason is despite having moved away primarily to get away from Jana, he's brought back into the relationship and, uh, he's driven crazy again, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, they're family. And, uh, and so that's kind of at the heart of the story, but uh, nailing 
the uh, that interaction and just the complicated nature of what's going on with Jana was probably the hardest part. A crazy family member that, that drives you crazy, but you love them anyway. I can't relate to that at all. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Robert. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, Melissa saying, this is so great. She thought your accent was somewhere southern. Right. She went nowhere. <laughs> Melissa, thank you. She said she loves your reasoning. Absolutely. Uh, me too. So great to to get this. Uh, Lisa wants to know, what was your favorite book when you were a little boy? Gosh, it depends on how little like the I wasn't quick to read. You know, we we learned to read in the first grade back when I was coming up. And so I uh, I, I remember the Bobsy Twin books because they were the first books that, you know, I could just, you know, I could really gobble them up and they were easy reads. But I I love those books. And then um, I love the Encyclopedia Brown books when I was in like the fifth grade, sixth grade, loved all the uh the uh, Judy Bloom and uh, the Beverly Cleary books really liked them a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I liked the kind of the classic, you know, kid books a lot when I was when I was young. Oh, Lisa, thank you for the great question, Robert. Thank you for sharing uh, sharing that. Yeah, reading matters so much um, when you, when you were when you're little and, and it's so great to, to get that glimpse. Um, Ooh, Lisa has a question also about the title. She said, when, when do you decide on the title of your book before, during, or after you finish writing it? So I have, uh, like I'll have a working title. Um, a lot of times the working title becomes the title, like the professor was always the professor and never changed. Um, and then you'll have something like Rich Blood, where originally I had the title as the Gaslighter, and uh, we ended up changing it to Rich Blood because um, we thought it was uh, it was a kind of a joint effort. Um, and, and sometimes you know you like the other title, and it's hard to give it up. But um, I think uh, it's definitely a, a sort of a roundtable kind of uh, discussion with the publisher through emails about you know what can and I'll send out five or six ideas that I think would fit. And then we'll talk about which ones we like. But um, I've had it both ways where, you know, the one I came up with was sort of uh, uh, kind of tossed to the side because maybe it just, you know, it might confuse people. Like um, I had, uh, I guess my first book in the Bo Cephas Haynes series was originally going to be called uh, The General because one of the characters in the story was going to be on trial and her name was General Helen Lewis. Well, we uh, we thought that might confuse folks to think it was a military book and then when, when it's a legal thriller. And so and, and they were right, you know, and so uh, so sometimes sometimes I'm stubborn about it and I'll, I'll fight for the title, even though, you know, they're right. And uh, and I eventually come around to you know, we, we eventually come around to a decision. So well, I've been happy with that. <laughs> I love knowing that Rich Blood was originally called, you were originally calling it the Gaslighter. I have to yeah. say, I love the I love the play on their last name being Rich Blood and Jason's billboard being Get Rich. I mean, I just kind of it's so fun. Um, that's yeah. really cool. Leach is saying thank you so much for answering my question, Robert. Really, you're so welcome. She's adding that Beverly Cleary books are so awesome, and thank you again for answering her questions, Leach. Always a pleasure to have you. Um, Melissa saying she sounds so good. She can't wait to read your book and learn more about this Jana. Yes. So yeah. y'all, the book is not even out yet. It is out on Thursday and you can pre-order now. So here is the link. So I'm going to pop it in the comments. So pre-order it tonight and you, the good folks at Murder by the Book will put this in the mail to you when it drops on Thursday. So this is um, a special pre-launch event that Bob is joining us here to give us the inside scoop on his book, taking all of our questions and uh, telling us telling us how, how this book came to be. I have a question. Robert, how long did it take you to get this book done? So you shared The Professor, your first book took you, took you eight years. Um, wait, eight years, right? Eight years, yeah. Okay, so now you're on book eight. How long did book eight take you? It's somewhere between about seven to eight months. You know, the first draft wow. probably took about four or five months. And then the uh, the developmental editing process was about a month and a half, two months. And then copy editing and proofreading is another month or two. So it probably took me about eight months. It may have 
stretched out over 10, but it, I think the actual writing was probably only about eight. Wow. Okay. So what have you learned from a craft perspective from book one, eight years, book eight, eight months, you've gotten faster. You, you, you share that you feel stronger and better as a writer. What, what have you, what would you tell yourself uh, eight years ago? Hey, this well, is what you should know. <laughs> So one of my biggest faults early as a writer is I would have scenes where my main character would be, you know, brushing his teeth and thinking a lot, you know, and uh, or he would be sitting in or she would be sitting in the library or, in, you know, they would be reading a book and thinking and a lot of thoughts, but nothing happening in the story. And so, you know, I would tell myself then that, you know, you need to move the story. They need to be thinking on their way to doing something, you know. And, uh, and and having action, still having characterization, but making sure you're moving the story while you're doing it. And I, I've always I like character driven fiction. So I like stories where I really get to know the character. I love the Michael Connelly books by Harry Bosch because Harry Bosch likes jazz and he's everybody counts or nobody counts. And there's a lot of things about him that you know, resonate. And I haven't read a book of his in a while, but I, uh, I, I remember that character vividly, you know, the house looking out over the valley and um, all those details are captured as he's telling this really thrilling, you know, murder mystery and Bosch is doing all this stuff. And so um, I, uh, I've learned how to sort of pace the story to where you have a strong sort of fast start, then you let them catch a breath and meet the character some, and then you kind of get into the heart of it. And you kind of ramp it on up there towards the end. And so um, there's a kind of a pace to it. And um, I, have, I feel like, um, I don't know, I just feel, I used to say this when I was playing a lot of golf. I played golf in college. When I was playing a lot and really uh, feeling good about my game, I sort of felt oily where the club felt good in my hands. And, uh, you know, I, I felt good over putts. And when I come to... Uh, writing now because I do it every day and because, um, you know, we're continuing to, you know, to write different stories. Um, I just feel oily now. You know, I feel like I know what I'm doing. It's not uh, like I'm, you know, reinventing the wheel every time. And so uh, that the confidence of just having done it is, is big. Um, so, uh, so that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> Sorry. So one might say you are a well-oiled machine, a well-oiled <laughs> writing machine. Uh, Publishers <laughs> Weekly awarded you a starred review for The Wrong Side. Um, mm -hmm. It's so many amazing reviews we could get into, and we will in just a moment. But Heath, welcome to the conversation, would like to know, was it difficult to say goodbye to the professor, Robert? It was really difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. The professor uh, was... Um, very much based on my father who died in 2017 of lung cancer. And so Tom's story arc, uh, you know, really sort starts to mirror my dad's story arc there at the end. And so um, we finished those books in 2019, but certainly, you know, the last two books at least were kind of like, you know, gave me a chance to sort of spend some time with my dad in a way uh, very much, therapeutic, but really hard to say goodbye and really uh, wanted him to go out uh, appropriately, you know, like, you know, I wanted to feel good about that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to keep him doing things that weren't, uh, you know, up to his standards. So um, I really feel like kind of we nailed it with the final reckoning. I'm really happy with the way the story played out. But uh, yeah, it was hard and I miss him just like I miss my dad. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. I'm going to cry. That's so lovely, Robert. What a beautiful homage to your dad. Um, what a beautiful way to honor him in this character that has meant so much to so many readers. Um, and to know now that he, you know, that, 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 that he has stayed with you as the creator of this character and the son of, of the of of your dad in real life. Ah, oh, I love this conversation. He, thank you for that question, which let us know this. Um, uh, oh, it's, um, you shared that you love the Harry Bosch series. Leecha would like to know what other books you like to read. What's your favorite genre, and what are you reading now? Great questions, Leecha. So uh, the book I'm reading now is um, 
Five Decembers by James Kestrel. I won the Edgar Award last year. It's been on my shelf for a while. Ooh, okay. I'm really excited about that one. Um, I just finished reading The Old Man by Thomas Perry. That's now, I think, an Amazon series with Jeff Bridges. But um, it was fantastic. Um, and uh, I think my favorite new writer is S.A. Cosby, um, uh, Razorblade Tears and uh, Wastetop, or Blacktop Wasteland, my favorite books I read last year. So um, I sort of I love reading mystery thrillers, but I also I've, I've really gotten into Southern Gothic stuff. Uh, Eli, Eli Craner's book, Don't Know Tough, last year was fantastic. Um, that's, that was a really good story. And so uh, always looking for you know, new stuff. And that's probably one of the best things about Twitter and uh, Facebook is other writers recommending, you know, books. And so uh, I, uh, you know, I, a lot of times we'll, uh, we'll check that out. Um, that's why I read the old man as Lee Goldberg talked about it on, uh, on Facebook. And then uh, same thing. I think I got a hold of Eli Craner because S.A. Cosby recommended it. And uh, I, uh, I think I just saw that Cosby was winning a lot of awards and I was like, I got to check this guy out. Um, but um, I, you know, I always wait for the next Connolly book. You know, I love John Sanford and his prey novels. Um, I love getting into a character and following him over time. And I love Greg Isles. Greg Isles has written a lot of novels and he has this fictional world where, you know, his main character, Penn Cage will be the main character and then he'll make a cameo like in another book about somebody else. And so, I'm doing that now in my stories. It's always been a dream of mine, but in Rich Blood, there'll be a key McMurtry character that'll show up. And so it's a big Easter egg, you know, for the reader and also for me. So, uh, so that's kind of fun. It's a new series, but it's in the same fictional, you know, universe. So I've always wanted to do that. So I'm getting to do it with Rich Blood. Yay! I love <laughs> Easter eggs where they pop up like that, where you get to, you're like, ah! There, when they make a cameo, just a very casual cameo, and you have to be in the know to know. Like you have to right. have read the prior books to know. Otherwise, you might just read past it as a cool, cool character and a cool moment. But to to for for the for the fans, for the true fans, uh, that is very cool. So I linked the books that Robert recommended. So here um, is the link to The Old Man, which is a book that is new to me. Hadn't heard of that. Here is Five Decembers. Also had not heard of that. So thank you for those two recommendations. I am a huge fan of S.A. Cosby. Razor Blade Tears is one of my favorite books of the year. That is such a powerful, painful, beautiful portrait of these yeah. two yeah. men. Um, and and the and the, and the climate um, right now. Um, so here is the link to S.A. Cosby's Razor by the Tears. If you have not read that, um, do yourself a favor and check it out. Um, you will enjoy it. Oh my goodness, y'all, we're out of time. But I yeah. want to remind you guys: the book Robert's book is out on Thursday. Uh, the one that Patricia Cornwell herself called wildly entertaining. So check it out. Pre-order right now. I'm going to pop the link in the comments one more time just because you will want to pre-order it. So get your orders in tonight. And the good folks at Murder by the Book will get this out to you in the mail on Thursday so you too can get rich. Jason <laughs> Rich, that is. Jason and Jenna Rich. And enjoy this delicious world that Bob Bailey, uh, that Robert Bailey has created for us. So pre-order now here, I'm going to pop it up so you can grab it no matter where you're watching from. Um, Robert, thank you so much for coming on and giving us the inside scoop on Rich Blood. What a pleasure to, to hear from you and to, and to, uh, to get the inside scoop on, on your writing process, on these characters, on your cover, on your title. So much tea was spilled tonight. <laughs> Misha saying she enjoyed this live chat so much. Thank you, Sarah and Robert. I will be adding to my TBR. Yes, ma'am. Well, what a perfect note to end on. Robert Bailey, thank you so much for joining us. Y'all, happy Mystery Monday. We're not here next week. It is Labor Day, so I'll see y'all in two weeks uh, for Mystery Monday because, you know, Mondays can be murder. Have a great night.